Well, I hope this doesn't interrupt your meal. Um, feel free to continually help yourself. Thank you so much for all the food, for your company, for your presence. Um, I don't know if you have plans after this, so I, I definitely want to get started. That way I don't hold up anyone, you know, if they have to go somewhere afterwards. But as you can see from tonight, it's a tale of two love stories. You may recognize them from history, you may not. Um, but either way, they have a lot to teach us from Scripture. So we're going to take a quick look at that. Um, but before we begin, if you don't mind just bowing your heads with me in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Sabbath day. You say where two or three or more are gathered, there your presence is. And we want your Holy Spirit to come upon us. We want to honor you the Sabbath day. And we just want to come together in Christian fellowship. So thank you for everyone here, their friendship, and the blessing they are to me and Jeff. Um, please be with us as we share this. And please help it to be something that can bless and edify all of us. In your precious name, amen. So... As you'll see from the next slide in just a minute, this couple on the top is probably one of the most famous couples in history. You could use the word notorious. Some people think they're a romantic couple. Some people think they're despicable. Um, kind of depends who's telling the story. But Mark Antony and Cleopatra are probably one of the most famous love stories in history. And you can see from the next slide, there's actually a lot of women that have been vilified in history. Um, a lot of women that people sometimes will spit when they say their name or they have nothing but bad things to say about them. And we'll pull that up in just a minute. You can see here Jezebel from the Bible. Um, she was the only female priestess in scripture. Nothing good is said about her. Obviously, she corrupted her husband. And unfortunately, he killed a lot of innocent people because of this woman, Jezebel, on the top left. And then when we go to the right, we have Herodias. Um, as you know, that's Herod's wife. He actually wanted his brother's wife, forced them to get a divorce, married her, and called her Herodias. But she was a willing part of that as well. So we know her for being instrumental in getting the head of John the Baptist cut off. And then if we go to the bottom, we can see Marie Antoinette um, during the French Revolution, where literally millions of French people were starving. They came to her and they said, the French people are starving, they need bread. Supposedly, she said, let them eat cake, because she was too busy partying, she was too busy doing her own thing. And eventually, she actually was put on the guillotine. Ironically, the man who invented the guillotine, that's the block that would chop off your head, he was actually killed on it as well. And they said when she was put on the guillotine, her blonde hair actually completely turned white. And there's been some instances of that in history where a parent has received news of the death of a child or a loved one, and their hair has immediately turned white. So it's very rare, but it can happen. And supposedly it happened to Marie Antoinette. So not only are these hated women in history, but last but not least, we have Cleopatra at the bottom. And she's probably most famous for being portrayed by Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I actually never saw the movie, but I hear that it was very highly rated. A lot of people liked it, and she's known for playing Cleopatra. But a lot of people don't realize she was actually predicted in Scripture. So we're going to look at a few verses tonight. Where exactly was Cleopatra predicted in Scripture? And Normally, we want to focus on the good instead of the bad, but before we get to the good, we do want to go through the bad because God includes all this in Scripture for it to be a blessing to us. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. So the example of Cleopatra is actually written down for us to better understand and to learn from her wicked ways. There's a very famous portrayal here of her she had many individuals in her life, but this is the most famous, Mark Antony, and their story is the one we're going to focus on for part of this presentation. Now, to give you a little historical background to Cleopatra and Antony, we can see from these charts here, whenever there's a Bible prophecy, it always covers the exact same format. It always starts with Babylon, then it goes to Medo-Persia, then it goes to Greece, then it goes to Rome. And sometimes it's easy for the Bible prophecies to blend together, but we can see in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it always follows the exact same format. And Mark Antony and Cleopatra are actually a major part of this. Um, you can see here on the screen, wherever it says Rome, 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 they were actually major players during this time where Rome was a world power. And as we can see from this next slide here, this is a little background to where Cleopatra came from. A lot of people think she's Egyptian because she was queen of Egypt, but she was actually not. She was Macedonian Greek, so she was significantly fairer skinned, probably had dark hair, dark eyes, but she actually had 0% Egyptian blood in her. 
And this goes back to Alexander the Great. We know from Bible prophecy, when he died, um, we don't know for sure if it was poisoning or if it was alcohol poisoning or if it was malaria, but he died in 331 BC, and right away they killed his baby boy. So there was four generals that started fighting over his empire, and then pretty soon it was three generals. And they actually ended up dividing his empire four ways. And one of his generals, Ptolemy, you can see in the purple there, he got all of that part of Egypt. So it was his descendants that were actually ruling Egypt. They were not Egyptian. They were actually Greek Macedonian. So this is a little historical background as to where Cleopatra came from. Now, if we look at different ancient sources, some people say she was very beautiful. Some people say she was ugly, but she was seductive. And there's one book I read. It says there's one thing that makes everybody attractive. That's money. And Cleopatra certainly had a lot of money. If we look at Plutarch, he says her beauty in and of itself wasn't really that remarkable, but it was the attraction of her person. It was the charm of her conversation. It was bewitching. It was a pleasure merely to hear the sound of her voice, which was like an instrument of many strings. She could pass from one language to another so that there were a few of the nations that she actually needed an interpreter. And this was very, very surprising because she was actually the only queen of Egypt who could actually speak Egyptian. All those other kings and queens before her were Greek Macedonian. Nobody even cared about the Egyptian people that they were ruling. She was the only one who ever spoke the Egyptian language. And Cicero, another Roman um, writer, says her way of walking, her clothes, her free way of talking, her embraces, her kisses, her beach parties, her dinner parties, they all show her to be a tart. So even back then, she had some haters. Cicero was one of them. She was known to be very stuck up. But rightfully so, she was the richest woman in the world. She was the most famous woman in the world. Supposedly, she was very beautiful. She could speak several languages. That they say anywhere from six to eight different languages. And when we look at her background even a little bit more, it's kind of weird. But the reason why I go into it is it's going to help us understand Bible prophecy a lot more. She was actually born in 69 BC in Egypt to sibling parents. And I know that's really disgusting. But that was actually normal back then in Egypt. They would marry brothers and sisters to each other, thinking that nobody would ever fight over the kingdom. As you can imagine, it actually caused more civil warfare and more deaths, um, understandably so. But her parents were actually Ptolemy and Cleopatra. They didn't really change the name that much. There was like a bunch of Ptolemies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it went up to like Ptolemy the 10th or something. There was a bunch of Cleopatras, so her mother was Cleopatra the 10th. And like I said before, they were not actually Egyptian. They were Macedonian, and she was very bright and educated, even as a young child. Um, her lover, who she meet later in life, Mark Antony, he actually met her when she was 14. And obviously, he wasn't in love with her then, but he was very charmed with her, because even at 14, she was beautiful, but she was very rich, and she spoke a lot of languages. But when she was a teen, her sister, Bernice, actually raised up an army against her father and mother, and they had to put down that army and actually kill her sister. And then, when she was 18 years old, she got married to her 10-year-old brother. And like I said, that was really, really normal. Um, her name was obviously Cleopatra. Her brother's name was Ptolemy. So they just added another numerical value at the end of that word. So she was now Cleopatra the 11th, and her brother was Ptolemy the 8th, or excuse me, Ptolemy the 13th. So as she was married to her brother, you can imagine how disgusting that would be. She was not thrilled about it, even though it was normal, it was expected. So right away, she raises up an army. Her brother raises up an army. Her brother's army is stronger because generally back then they favored the male. So she got chased all the way into Syria. But there was actually a lot of men who were very faithful to her because, like I said, she was very charming. So it was there, raising up a troop in Syria, that she actually started fighting the civil war with her husband slash brother. And this is where Julius Caesar comes in. So before there was a Mark Antony, there was a Julius Caesar. And this was actually predicted in scripture. So when we go to the next slide, we're not going to read all of Daniel 11. I feel like that could be something that would take two or three hours. Really, we're only scratching the surface. I'm only picking out the part here that actually specifically predicts Cleopatra, Mark Antony, Julius Caesar, and Caesar Augustus. Now, of course, it doesn't give us their names. But if we study history, we can see exactly how she fit into there. So if we go back to Daniel chapter 11, it says that Pompey and the Romans are going to come against him, Julius Caesar. There was civil war in Rome at this time. Julius Caesar wanted to be dictator. Nobody else wanted him to be dictator. So he starts fighting his friend Pompey. But it's kind of complicated because he's married to Pompey's daughter. 
So like I said, things back then were kind of sick, kind of complicated, and they start fighting each other. And the Bible specifically says that he will stand in the glorious hand by which his hand shall be consumed. Pompey had actually gone to the glorious land. He'd actually gone to Jerusalem. And what he is best known for is he actually went into the Holy of Holies, tore back that veil, and looked into the Holy of Holies. So in Scripture, it's actually telling us he's going to stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He was consumed because he had to run away from Julius Caesar. He got to Egypt. As soon as he got off the Nile, they chopped off his head, they put it in a basket, and then when Julius Caesar came to town, they presented the head of Pompey. So just like Scripture says his hand is going to be consumed, it's going to be cut off, literally his hand, his power, his head, to be particular, was actually cut off and put in a basket. And they gave it to Julius Caesar, and he cried and was like, oh, my friends, my comrade, I can't believe they did this to you. That's where we get the term crocodile tears, fake tears, because they had been fighting a civil warfare. Obviously, they didn't like each other, so I'm sure Julius Caesar was really happy that he was dead. So he's crying these fake tears, and that's where we get the term crocodile tears. But then the prophecy goes on. It says that the Romans are going to march up and give him the daughter of woman. He's going to corrupt that woman, but she's not going to stand at his side, and she's not going to be for him. So Julius Caesar sees the head of Pompey, gets off the Nile, goes into the palace right away, and everybody thinks he's going to side with Cleopatra's brother, Ptolemy. But Cleopatra, like I said, was incredibly intelligent. She was all the way in Syria, so she made it back with a slave, and she actually had the slave wrap her up in a carpet and sneak her back into the palace. Because here's a slave, nobody's going to question him. He's just carrying a carpet, not really a big deal. So he brings the carpet into Julius Caesar's chamber, unveils the carpet, and there she is, 18 years old, very beautiful, very charming, speaking a multitude of languages. And Julius Caesar loved pageantry. He loved theater. So to him, this was completely exotic. He was immediately entranced. And she was very young. He was about 30 years older than her. I think he was 52, 53 at the time. And they immediately start having an affair. And it says here that he corrupted her, which most likely he did because um, even though she was married, it was her brother. So most likely this was the first time she had been with anyone. And even scripture says Julius Caesar corrupted her. But it said she would not stand at his side, neither before him. She didn't love him. She was only trying to be with him to protect her empire. Because Julius Caesar could have taken all of Egypt. But by him falling madly in love with her, he allowed her to remain queen of Egypt. And as could be expected, he killed her brother as she wanted him to. Then she had another sister revolt. And sure enough, Julius Caesar ended up exiling that sister. So she was not standing for him. She was actually um, just using him for her own political gains. But then it says after this in verse 18, he's going to turn his face unto other isles. Julius Caesar was a warrior. He starts hearing about other things. So he leaves Egypt. He goes to other isles and other parts of the world. But then it says, A prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn on him. And we're all very famous, 40, or we're all very familiar with this. 44 BC, Julius Caesar goes into the Senate. All of the senators surround him, and they stab him to death. So sure enough, the princes, the senators of Rome, when Julius Caesar came back to Rome, they assassinated him and they killed him, just like Scripture predicted. So, kind of crazy, kind of got to read into it, because like at first glance, Daniel 11 is just a bunch of verses, but when you study the history with it, you're like, wow, that's totally exact. The way that it mentions Pompey, the way that it mentions Julius Caesar, the way that it mentions Cleopatra. But Cleopatra did not fade from history. That was only the beginning of the story. When Julius Caesar was killed, Rome was plunged into civil war. And there was three guys that got together. We don't really know that much about Marcus. He's not really mentioned that much. But we know Octavian. Octavian actually became Caesar Augustus, the one that taxed the whole world in the time of Jesus. So all these pieces are kind of coming together. Octavian, Marcus, and Mark Antony said, all right, we need to avenge these senators. We need to actually get Rome together. We need to be a unified country. But whenever you have three people divide up an empire, that doesn't work really well. So they got rid of Marcus pretty quick, and then pretty soon it was Octavian and Mark Antony. But instead of getting along and splitting the empire, they started killing each other. So what did Mark Antony do? He went to Egypt. Egypt was the breadbasket of the world. A lot of that gold, a lot of the jewels had actually come from Africa. So he goes down there thinking that he's just going to talk to Cleopatra and try to get her to support his cause. However, he sees her. 
Um, at this time, she's a little bit older. Um, she's probably in her late 20s. He's in his 40s at this time. So there's not as much of an age difference as there was between Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. Plus Mark Antony, um, he came from a pretty reckless lifestyle. Um, he was a hard drinker. He had so much, he was so much in debt. He was literally millions of dollars in today's money in debt. But he was a warrior. His men loved him. And he was very, very good looking, significantly better looking than Julius Caesar. So Cleopatra supposedly fell in love with him right away. He supposedly fell in love with her right away. And when the whole Roman Empire is plunged into civil warfare, they're going on cruises down the Nile. They're wasting away the tax money by lavish entertainment. People around them are starving and getting killed. They don't care. They're spending their nights eating and drinking. Some of the depraved things they liked doing that were actually appropriate to write down were they enjoyed dressing up in costume and playing pranks on the people in the street. And they even deified themselves as gods. They would have these ceremonies and dress up like gods and have everybody worship them. And this is what's going on when all of Rome is plunged into chaos. We can see this is just an example here. And at first, you're like, okay, that looks like pretty exotic, looks like a nice time. But everybody in Rome is fighting and killing each other. The people of Egypt are starving. And Cleopatra and Mark Antony are going on these pleasure cruises down the Nile. And the prophecy actually goes on in Daniel 11. It's going to talk about the civil warfare that's going to intensify. Because right now, Mark Antony is madly in love with Cleopatra. They're having the time of their lives in Egypt, but the nation is in ruins. And remember, Octavian and Mark Antony are fighting for control of Rome. So at that point, the Bible actually says, it goes into more detail. It says, Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. His army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Well, Antony's soldiers were sick and tired of him partying away while they were dying. So actually, a lot of Antony's soldiers defected. They actually deserted to Octavian and started fighting for Octavian because at least Octavian was with his men. He was actually a really moral guy considering um, his surroundings, where Mark Antony was just doing these crazy things in Egypt. So the Bible even predicts that those that feed of the portion of his meat would actually desert him and his army would run away. And then it says, both of these king's hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak lies at one table. There was a few times Mark Antony and Octavian tried to come to a treatise. They tried to come to a truce. In fact, what's really messed up here is Antony actually married Octavian's sister. And this is why he's in love with Cleopatra. So they are literally doing exactly what the Bible said. They're doing mischief to each other. They're speaking lies to each other. But it didn't prosper. For the end of it shall be the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. He shall do exploits and return to his own land. And we can see later on they were against the holy covenant. We see that in scripture where Rome totally destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. So I know it's a lot of information. If you want to study it more, a lot of us have studied it together during our Daniel Bible study. So all you have to do is go to the Fort Myers SDA YouTube channel, search for Daniel 11, and it'll actually go into a lot more depth. But I show that to you because Cleopatra and Mark Antony are a very, very famous so-called love story in Scripture. But they were actually predicted, or in history they were a very famous love story, but they were actually predicted in Scripture. And when we look, how did this love affair end? Well, Cleopatra had about four children with Mark Antony. From all accounts, she actually loved him very much. But he was actually married to Octavian's sister who was in Rome, so he was bouncing back and forth between Rome and between Egypt. And there was one time he brought Cleopatra to Rome. The Roman people absolutely hated it. They hated her. They blamed her for all the problems that Rome was experiencing. And on one hand, it was kind of true because she really captivated two of its rulers, and she kind of plunged them into chaos, into high taxation. A lot of people were starving while she was eating, drinking, and just making merry. So during the civil warfare, there was actually a very famous battle predicted in scripture. I don't know how you say it, but I think it's the Battle of Actium. It was in Greece. It was on the water. And Mark Antony's troops were totally defeated. And Octavian's troops chased them. They were on the water, chased them all the way back to Alexandria, Egypt. And as soon as they got to Alexandria, Egypt, Mark Antony on the top thought Cleopatra was dead. So he takes a sword plunges it into his chest, but then they're like, no, 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 she's not dead. So then they drag his dying body to Cleopatra. He asks for some alcohol right before he dies, makes a toast to her, and then dies. And then she knows that she's going to be killed as soon as the Romans get her. 
So legend has it that at this point she got put under house arrest. She knows they're going to kill her or at least humiliate her. So supposedly she has a servant smuggling a basket of figs that has a venomous serpent in it, and then she lets the serpent bite her, and then she dies. Um, some people say that's not really true, that's just legend, but either way, she died in the end. And their so-called love affair ended with both of them dying. I think he was 52, 53 at the time, and she was 39, and all four of her children, I don't know if they were killed afterwards or if they were fostered out, but pretty much this was the last queen Egypt ever had, Egypt has never risen to that power again. It continues to be a very poor, uh, very broken country even today. And at first glance, if you watch this like in a Hollywood film or if you read about it or if there's any like shows on TV you like, they actually make it look like really exciting and like really exotic. Of course, they pick like really good looking people for the characters. Um, they make it look like they don't have a care in the world and it can look like this is an exciting love story. But the Bible is really, really specific about what the end results are going to be, and we can actually see it in their lives. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. They literally died, and not only are they dying there, most likely they're going to die on final judgment day again. And then Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. We know this, and sometimes it's easy to forget it, though. And Galatians 6, 7 to 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the flesh, and he will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So at first, it might look exciting, but it really wasn't. It tragically ended in an absolutely horrible way, and it's going to end in an even more horrible way on Judgment Day. And one of the reasons, as we go to the next slide, one of the reasons why this type of love ended so tragically was it was eros. Now, eros is not necessarily a bad sort of love. Um, there's actually eight types of Greek love. In America, we say love. So, like, I love chocolate. I love my dog. I love my husband. I love the church. I love my parents. I love a good book. Like, all those use the word love, but those are totally different types of love. We don't really distinguish here in America. However, in the Greek, which a lot of the Bible was written in Greek, there was actually eight different words for love. And as you can see here, when it was eros, that was like sensual, that was romantic love. When it was storge, that was like familial love, what you would have for a child or a parent. Philia would be brotherly love, like what we have here. And agape love is God's love for humankind. And that's ultimately the love he wants us to have. Now, there's obviously four other types of love, but these are the four main types of love that are actually mentioned in the Bible. And one of the reasons why their particular tragic, their love ended in tragedy was it was not storge. They certainly didn't love their family. They were divorcing their spouses. They were cheating on each other. Their children, sometimes they particularly didn't kill their children, but many of their family members had killed children. Um, it certainly was not agape because they did not care about anyone else. They were eating and drinking when everybody else was plunged into civil warfare. It definitely was not philia. So even though there should have been a balance of all four of these, for in their case, it was 100% eros, and that's ultimately what led to their failure. And when we look at the origin of eros, it's never actually stated in scripture. They don't use that word, but it's alluded to. It's actually not a bad word because other words come from it. We do associate it with being a bad, a sinful thing, but it's actually not. God designed it. Um, it was between Adam and Eve. It's between couples. Um, Song of Solomon refers to this a lot. Even Paul's command to married couples in the epistles, all of this involves eros love. So within the context of marriage, it's actually not a bad thing. However, the Greeks really corrupted it. And Valentine's Day, a lot of times you see a cupid like that, you know, little cartoon cupid or maybe like a strange statue cupid, kind of like that. But Eros was actually known for being a mischievous winged child armored with bows and arrows. The arrows signified desires and emotions of love, and Cupid aims these arrows at gods and humans, causing them to fall deeply in love. Cupid has always played a role in the celebrations of love and lovers. And even Mark Antony and Cleopatra, they believed in all these Greek gods, all this weird stuff that he was like this imagine, well, not imaginary, but this invisible Cupid who would just like hit them with an arrow and you couldn't control who you fell in love with. Well, that is actually totally contrary to scripture. So looking at this, we can see no wonder it ended in tragedy. And unfortunately, no wonder over 50% of homes actually end in divorce here in America. Because in America, eros oftentimes is the dominant form of love, and it's not balanced out by the other types of love. 
But scripture does say that everything is written for our admonition. Everything is written for us to learn from. So as we go to the next slide, we're actually going to learn from another couple. Now, this couple is a little bit more modern, takes place in the 1950s. I know everybody has their favorite era. I personally like the late 50s, early 60s. So this story really, really resonated with me. And Jim and Elizabeth Elliot met actually in college, but he wanted to serve Jesus. So even though he was attracted to her, he didn't want to get married because he really wanted to serve Jesus. He had a passion for going overseas and reaching a tribe that had never heard the name of Jesus. And there was multiple attempts, multiple tries where he tried to go overseas, but for some reason it didn't work out. But him and this woman that he was interested in, they actually felt that God was drawing them together. So they ended up getting married. And as soon as they got married, they actually went down to Ecuador because they had made contact with this tribe that had never heard the name of Jesus. These were people that were still living in huts, you know, um, running around in loincloths, you know, um, eating all kinds of crazy things, kind of just chanting and grunting. Um, their language is very difficult to understand. They couldn't read or write, but they felt that God had called them to go there. So he goes down there with four or five other men his age, all really young. I think it was like mid to late 20s. And they decide to share Jesus with these individuals. But these individuals were known to kill every single white person that went their way. Because other people had gone down there for like natural resources to get rich, and it had always ended in death. So they knew it was probably going to end like that. So they started making contact with them, like dropping stuff from their planes, um, trying to drop things they think they would like, smiling, waving, things like that. And eventually, they thought that they had made some positive contact, that they could actually go out and meet them. And when they got down off the plane, all of them were macheted to death. And the story actually doesn't end there. I can't imagine what the family must have felt when they heard that because many of these young men had children at this time. But this is what blows my mind. His wife, Elizabeth, and some of the other women, even though they must have grieved because their husbands were lost, they went back to America for safety. But then they came back with their young children. They lived among the natives, and they won many of them to Jesus. And many of those people there are actually Christians today because of women like Elizabeth Elliot and others like her who actually took their young children back there to share Jesus with these people. And it's such a powerful story that they actually tell it a lot better on this YouTube link. So I was hoping that maybe in the back, if you could just play that, it's about five minutes. But this is the total opposite of Eros love. Eros love is totally fine within the context of a marriage, but this involved storge, this involved agape, this involved philia. This was the ultimate of loves for them to go back. Welcome to the story of liberty. On this day, February 21st in 1952, a man named Jim Elliott, a missionary, arrived in Ecuador with the purpose of evangelizing the Ecuadorian Indians. It's an amazing story and there was actually a film made about these young men. Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, Roger Udarian, and Nate Saint, who was their pilot all Christian missionaries, very special young men. Jim Elliott and his friends went to the jungles of Ecuador. They had sought to bring the gospel to the most primitive savage people on the face of the earth, the Akua Indians. They prepared themselves well. They even devised a method with their plane to make a tight circle to lower down to the ground all sorts of gifts in a basket to make friends with the Akua Indians. They did this for weeks at a time because the Akuas had no contact with the outside world. In fact, it was told that they killed just about every person who entered into that jungle. As time passed, these missionaries they felt comfortable enough to land their plane on the beach of the river. At first, a couple of women came out of the jungle, then a young man, and then others. For several days, they reported that things were going well, and they gained the confidence in the friendship of the Akuas. And they hoped that they would soon be able to tell them about Jesus Christ and his gospel. Well, 
Eventually, out of the bushes they came, a horde of Akuas with eight-foot spears, and they plunged them through the bodies of these five young missionaries. On January 8, 1956, Jim Elliott was killed, along with his friends, mutilated bodies that were found downstream. You know, they had guns, but they didn't use them. When the Akua men came toward them, they did not shoot. Several of the men who killed Jim and his friends became Christians later in life. One of them actually gave a testimony at a meeting and he counted on his fingers and he said, I have killed 12 people with my spear, but I did that when my heart was black. Now Jesus' blood has washed my heart clean, so I don't like that anymore. There's an amazing story of grace here about the father of one of those young men, one of those five missionaries. He was a big man and the story goes that he said when he heard that these savages, what they had done to his son, that he decided to go to Ecuador. He was very angry and when he got on the train, he went into that jungle to find him. He took a group of guides into that jungle and he found the particular Indian that had plunged that spear into the body of his son. The dad of one of these missionaries who was killed, he actually took hold of this man who killed his son in his arms and he said to him, in the name of Jesus, I love you. Folks, this is very close to what the grace of God is all about. It's not quite the full meaning of what the grace of God is, the amazing grace of God, but it does bring us to the fact of a greater sacrifice, even laying down of one's life, the sacrifice of giving one's own life. Jim Elliott, the great Christian martyr in Ecuador, once said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. God bless you. Back again in your faces, see some old friends. It's good to be here to be able to proclaim the message of God from this platform once again. It's gone on hundreds of times and I hope that we haven't gotten over the thrill that it's going on because after all, we're fulfilling a prophecy of Jesus Christ every time we preach the gospel. More than that, we ourselves... If you are struggling to lose weight and secretly want Sorry, to escape from the prison... Sorry, we can't control the commercials, just like random commercials. <laughs> so, could have been, could have been worse. So the Elliots here, what blows my mind is that his family actually went back, his father went back to forgive the natives, his wife, his children went back, and his son has actually ministered to the natives, and he's still ministering to them today. And one of the most famous quotes by Jim Elliot, um, you see it a lot if you look him up online, is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So he knew he was going to lose his body anyways in this life, and he was willing to give it in order to share Jesus with others. In fact, at that little sermon where you could hear his voice at the end, it was saying every time they share the gospel, they're fulfilling prophecy. So even though he's not technically mentioned in scripture, he is sharing the gospel with the, all the world to the ends of the world. And he's actually fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus Christ. And there was another quote from the next screen we can see that really resonated with me. It says, it makes me boil when I think of the power we profess and the other impotency of our actions. Believers who know one-tenth as much as we do are doing 100 times more for God with his blessing and our criticism. Oh, if I could write it, preach it, say it, paint it, anything at all, if only God's power would become known among us. And he's so true because there's five communist countries still on this earth, China obviously being one of them, but the more Christian Chinese are being persecuted, the more are coming to Jesus. Many of those people don't even have a Bible, but the Holy Spirit's being poured out on them 
They are healing the sick people. They're casting out demons. In fact, I heard one story of one Bible was like for a whole village. So they separated all the books and like each family would get a book for the week and then they would, you know, trade it around. So hopefully by the end of the year, everybody would have alternated books of the Bible. But they said in that one week's time, people were memorizing as much of the book as possible because they only had like one week for the book of Nahum or one week for the book of Psalms. And people that literally have one hundredth or literally who know one-tenth as much as we do, sometimes are doing more than us. And I'm not necessarily talking about you guys. Like, you guys do so much for the church and for other people. But just like the American church in general, you know, I'm part of that as well. Like, people that know way less, that are not blessed with what we're blessed with, are actually doing way more for Christ. And a lot of Christians are being persecuted, and Voice of the Martyrs actually says they're not praying to get delivered from persecution. They actually appreciate the persecution. When we were studying Bible study this last week, where I think it was on chapter 11 of last day events, and it was talking about how there's actually going to be a lot of benefits to persecution. It's going to purge out the unbelieving out of the church. Those that are left is going to draw them together in unity. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on them in a mighty way, and the latter rain is going to bring in Jesus' second coming. So these Christians in other countries actually recognize that, and they're not praying for persecution to go away. They're actually praying for them to remain faithful during persecution. So if you ever want to check out his journal, um, he was a meticulous journaler. He had a lot of sermons. You could just check him out online. His name is Jim Elliott. But when we go to this next slide here, that's actually his son, which is pretty amazing. Um, he still works with the natives today. And I love when we watch this in just a minute. Like sometimes when we're filled with worldly things, I talk about, I'm speaking to myself here. Like when you study the story of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, you know it's sinful, but it's still really interesting. And it's very exotic and it's very fast paced. There's always like something happening. And then when you go to like testimonies like this, there's a translator. The guy's speaking kind of slow. They're waiting kind of slow. They're translating. They're trying to understand the message. Like sometimes it's harder to follow along because it's so much slower. But it's absolutely more amazing and more evidence of the power of God because as his son here interviews one of the men that killed his father, you can see the love on his face. You can see the patience in his voice. You can see the demeanor. And I truly believe I can see the spirit of God in him. And it's the man that killed his father that's actually telling people to repent and come to Jesus Christ. So this next testimony here is about five minutes here. And Obviously, there's going to be some translating going on, but these are like two guys who should absolutely hate each other, but they're coming together in brotherly love, and not only filial love, but actually agape love. He's saying, people, do you know how to walk God's trail? He gave us his markings so that we can see the trail. When the Waurani used to kill each other, they would be separated, but the children would follow their father's markings so that they could find him again. And these are God's markings. He sent his son down here, dripping his blood. He marked the trail. And with that same blood, Grandfather says, Father Creator can wash our hearts clean like the sky when it has no clouds in it so we can see this trail. You just have to follow the markings. And my Waurani, but the Waurani, but the Waurani, in, in my place where, I, where we live in the jungle, I teach the people, if you walk your trail, where are you going to end up? Your name is not written there. But he said, but if you walk God's trail, your name is, all, your name is already marked there. And coming there, God has made a place for us to live. It's like he knows when we go into the motel, we have to write our name there to sleep. And he says, your name is already written there at the place that God has made. You don't even have to play, pay a room rate. No tax. He didn't say that, obviously. He said, if you're, if you're not a coming after one, then maybe you won't understand this. Ask God to clean your heart so that you too can see it. If you don't walk God's trail, he doesn't know your name. You're going on your own trail. That's bad, bad. That makes me cry, he said. 
Ringan bandit puni mini. Ringan ama ibu kamu nak ke mana? Kan tarik ni nyong kek. My heart was dark like my shirt. Kau mesti mengingat bandit puni mini ini mini ini. Mini kau kau, awak ni tahu tu puni kau pin apa? Bicara muda bagi mui bapun. But the, but the king calls to us. The, they don't have any leadership, but he knows that the king is the strong one who can tell us what to do. He said, the king is calling to us and calling to us. Come walk my trail. I want to be reunited with you. I don't know who came up. I don't know who came up. God calling to me said, which trail do you want to walk? And I finally answered, I want to walk your trail. Why would I walk my own trail with no place waiting for me there? He says, in God's place, it's like Odo. It's like gold. It's a very good place. He knows we all wear gold to signify precious, and so he's saying, "You folks like gold. Wait till you get to God's place." He's inspired. He said, "I think you were like me before. You didn't see this trail either, did you?" Somebody has to teach us to walk the trail. Somebody has to teach us the markings, and then we need to teach others. Later, he says, when I was living badly, badly, then what happened? Then Star, uh, Aunt Rachel, and Woodpecker, Aunt Betty, she's very tall, long neck. He said, they came, and they are the ones that taught me God's markings. My heart was dark. My heart was dark like this. How could I see? How could I see? I, nobody had ever showed me this trail. I didn't know how to walk it. I said no to the king. What the king said, I said no at first. But God called my own name to him. Now my heart is not dark anymore. God sent his own son down here to the dirt so that he could show us how. Why would any of you not want to be coming after ones? Why would you not want to walk the same trail that God's own son, his only son, marked for us with his blood. So, to me, that it's just amazing. Like At first, if you watch that, you're like, okay, it's a little bit slower paced. But to think that's the son of the man that was killed who actually went back as a child with his mother to try to witness to the natives, brings them to Christ. And not only does he bring them to Christ, but like throughout the whole interview, he's so kind, he's so patient. Um, just his mannerisms, I feel, radiate agape love, the love of Jesus Christ. So when we go to these last few slides, to kind of close up here, um, even though they're both considered love stories, I don't even consider Mark Antony and Cleopatra a love story. Anything that starts with, like, lust, adultery, taking someone else's wife, betraying, killing them, it might sound exciting in the movies, but the end result of that is always death. And sometimes people meet their fate in this lifetime, such as they did. I mean, she was only 39 when supposedly she allowed herself to get bit by a snake and died. Um, Mark Antony was only like 52, 53. I consider that very young, both of them, and they tragically died. So in their lives, it seemed probably pretty fun for a little bit, but they were living in sin. They were fulfilling their fleshy desires. Even though there's not necessarily anything wrong with Eros love, they were experiencing it outside the context of traditional marriage. That was a major issue. Um, they depleted their nations of millions of dollars. Um, Egypt was pretty much run into the ground. And even to this day, um, I know for our honeymoon, like we did a Mediterranean cruise and we wanted to stop in Egypt, but even already back then, there was a travel advisory. So Egypt today continues to be a very corrupt, very dangerous country. It never reached the heights that it had reached earlier in its history. And part of that is because of her. 
Um, it resulted in untold deaths, not only in Rome, but in Egypt as well. And obviously, both of them ended up committing suicide by two very painful ways, sword and snake bite. But then you contrast them to Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. He also died by the sword. However, he probably died with a smile on his face, praising God. Um, not only did his, him and his wife love each other, but they actually loved their enemies. They had that agape love that very few people have. And I know that's something I'm striving for, but sometimes I wonder, do I have agape love? Probably not. And that's something that we'll talk about in this next slide. If agape love is something that you desire, which I'm sure as Seventh-day Adventist Christians you do, it certainly is something that I desire as well. Thankfully, Scripture gives us a lot of things that we can do to try to cultivate that love. Um, we can help people out of a tight spot, particularly if they're enemies. Um, it's easy to do it, I think, if it's a friend or a loved one. But I know for me, like, if there's someone I don't care for, they're kind of in a tight spot, your, your sick, twisted nature is kind of like, oh, finally, you deserve that. But, like, a real Christian who shows real agape love will actually look for a way to help their enemy out of a tight spot. Um, a real Christian with agape love will get them help when you can't help. Um, I know for me, sometimes it's easy to say, oh, I can't do that. But real agape love will actually get them help even if I can't provide it. Um, a real Christian will pray for them, whether it's a family member, friend, but especially an enemy. Um, a real Christian will rebuke them when needed. That's really hard because I don't like rebuking people. I know that my students probably think I like it, but that's part of the job. But like generally, especially if it's a peer or an adult, that's super awkward. I don't necessarily like doing it. But if you really, really love someone and you're really, really concerned about their behavior, a real Christian will rebuke them with love. Um, number five, a real Christian will freely forgive offenses. Um, I know I have to remind myself sometimes, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is not easily offended. And it's so easy, and especially at this day and age, um, just to be easily offended. People, I feel like, are a little ruder than they used to be. Sometimes they feel like they can just say it. And I'm left there just like thinking like, wow, I can't believe you just said that. But a real Christian will actually freely forgive them and overlook that offense. Um, a Christian with agape love will humbly serve all the people around them. They will meet their physical needs. They will rejoice and mourn with them. They will show kindness to someone they love. They will intercede with others on their behalf. They will help to work out their differences. They will introduce them to Jesus, just like we saw in the video. They will encourage and disciple them. And if needed, they will lay down their life for them. And that is truly the utmost definition of agape love. Jim Elliott knew he was probably going to lay down his life for them, and he ultimately did. So agape love is selfless love, the love God wants us to have. Just, excuse me. Agape love is selfless love. The love God wants us to have isn't just an emotion, but a conscious act of the will, a deliberate decision on our part to put others ahead of ourselves. This is the kind of love God has for us. So in the past, I've been so guilty of associating Valentine's Day with, like, romantic love. And I have a wonderful husband, so it's easy to. However, um, Valentine's Day is so much more than that. Not that we even need a holiday to celebrate, per se. But hopefully this Valentine's is just a time for us to reflect on the different types of love that we have in our life. Um, obviously, it's a good thing to build up Eros love. It's a good thing to build up filial love, the love of your brothers. It's a good thing to build up Storge, which is like family love. But ultimately, this Valentine's Day, we really want to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with agape love. Because it doesn't come naturally. Like Billy Graham says, it's a conscious act. Every day, you're going to have to like, determine in your heart, I'm going to love people even when it's really difficult. So, if you're interested, coming next week, um, please come. Thank you for all the amazing food this week. And if you don't mind, I think I might take a few doggy bags to go because it all looks really good. Um, but next week is going to be a little bit more informal. There'll still be a presentation. It'll be from 6 to 7. The presentation is not going to be an hour, but it will be like, it will be like potluck style. Um, so if you want to bring something wonderful, um, you did so much this week, so don't feel like you have to. But it will be a potluck style, and then there'll be a presentation called How Deep the Father's Love. And that presentation is going to go through four episodes in history that really show us how deep God's love for us is. And then at 7 p.m., we're going to have some games. Um, one of them will be Bible trivia. Another one will be how we met guessing game. That's always kind of fun. So basically you have pieces of paper at the table and the man in the relationship writes down how they met, the female writes down how they met, and then people read them up here and you kind of guess what couple it is. And you'll find out some pretty exciting stuff. Um, my grandpa and grandma, for example, he's a retired Seventh-day Adventist minister. I had no idea that they eloped 
And because her family disliked him so much, they actually continued to live in separate houses after they got married. And it wasn't until three months later that my grandma's mother found out they got married and she was absolutely livid. So at that point, they had to move out on their own. So since then, he's become a minister, very godly man, but he was not a godly man at the time. You'll find out all kinds of stuff. Um, it is kind of interesting. It's kind of fun to, like, you know, hear how other people met. If you would like to, you can bring a um, picture, like, when you were first dating or maybe when you first got married. And we just have a board. Um, we won't damage the picture. We'll just put a little piece of tape on the back so that we can peel it off. And we'll put it on the board. People sometimes have fun looking at that uh, to see what you were like when you first met each other. And then we're going to have a who knows each other best game. That's kind of fun. Um, you get couples up here, and then you ask questions, and they both have to answer, and you see who knows each other best. And if you'd like to come, we'd love to have you. Um, it'll be a presentation, a potluck, and then there'll be some games. Um, I know that I have a couple coworkers coming, so um, obviously I plan things so that I feel comfortable having other people come. So if you want to invite a neighbor or a friend, um, it's a pretty non-denominational um, seminar. The four stories are going to focus on four ways in history that God showed his love for us. And then the second part will be like games and just socialization and things like that. So that will be um, next week, but it will be on Saturday night at 6 p.m. So since the Sabbath is here, if you don't mind closing your eyes as we close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for bringing us here safely. Thank you that we have the privilege of worshiping together. And I ask that you just be with us this Valentine's Day season. I know that I've been guilty sometimes of just being pretty much selfish and like bettering my own means and my own desires. But you have so many other forms of love and the highest of these is agape. So please give me agape love. Please give everyone in this audience agape love. And let us leave here more determined to help our enemies, to help those that are difficult, and ultimately, as much as we don't want to, to be willing to lay down our lives for them. Thank you for loving us, and thank you that you're coming soon. And we ask that you bless the many people coming to church tomorrow, and please bring them together here in safety so that we can worship together. In your precious name, amen.